from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Judy Kent. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, today our focus is to give you a small sample of the stories of service that these veterans have recorded for the Veterans History Project. You'll hear some of the questions that we typically ask veterans in the somewhat more private reporting sessions back home. Like those private sessions, these will be guided conversations rather than formal speeches. We know that many of you have your own stories to tell, and we hope that when you get home, you'll take advantage of the opportunity and record them for the Library of Congress. Okay, I'll give the mic back to Frederick so he can introduce our honored guests. Thank you, Judy. Uh, my name is Frederick Wallace. I am a uh, volunteer with AARP, and I am the coordinator of the Veterans History Project for AARP Georgia. And that is how I got involved in this project, which has been a delightful experience. As Judy mentioned, we are honored to have with us this afternoon three veterans who all have seen combat during World War II. And I will introduce them to you, and then we will begin our conversation afterwards. Robert Bloxham served with the U.S. Merchant Marines during the war. His experience in his, exper his experience with the Merchant Marines began after he graduated from the Pennsylvania school ship in 1941. During the war, his assignments took him to South Africa, England, and the Persian Gulf at the time when ships faced frequent air and submarine attacks. At the age of 24, Mr. Bloxham became captain of the Liberty ship Lillian Nautica sailing his ship to Antwerp, Belgium, two weeks after it had been liberated from the Germans. He left the Merchant Marines in 1948, and two years later joined the U.S. Coast Guard. He remained with the Coast Guard until his retirement. Mr. Bloxham, would you raise your hand, please? In 1943, at the age of 18, Joseph DeLuca was assigned to the 411th Regiment of the 103rd Infantry Division. In 1944, he was shipped overseas. During his two-year European assignment, he saw combat in Belgium, Germany, Austria, and Italy. After the defeat of Germany, he served with the Army of Occupation as an MP in the Seventh Army in Heidelberg, Germany. He also served as part of the Honor Guard when General George Patton died. Mr. DeLuca? <laughs> Excuse me a moment while I get my other set of eyes. Mr. Higgins, Mr. Marty Higgins, just Marty. Marty joined the 101st Cavalry Regiment, Squadron C in Brooklyn, New York, and was sent to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. He received his cavalry commission at Fort Riley, Kansas in 1941, and was assigned to the 10th Cavalry Regiment in California. In 1944, he was sent to Africa, transferred to the 36th Texas Infantry Division, participated in the invasion of southern France, and took command of A Company. He was captured at the end of that year, sent to Luchenwald, Germany, and was liberated by the Russians in 1945. He returned to the United States following his release from service in 1945. Marty. 
Now that uh, we have completed the introductions, we will get started with our conversation. Judy? We'll begin at the beginning. How did you come to serve with your particular branch of the military? Let's start with Mr. DeLuca. Well, you don't volunteer for the infantry, but just hold they, it were, like they were hurting for infantrymen, and when I enlisted, that's where I ended up. It's about the worst spot in the Army. Well, when they shipped me overseas, we landed at uh, Marseille, France, to let the pressure off the people on D-Day one to spread the German forces out. We fought through the Vosges Mountains in France, and that was the first, in modern, or in military history, we were the first army that ever penetrated the Vosges Mountains. Then we kept on going and through uh, the Maginot, Siegfried, the Rhine River, and ended up in Innsbruck, Austria, and the war was over, and we were still alive. Okay. That was the shortened version. <laughs> Mr. Higgins, how did you choose your particular branch of the military? Actually, I joined the National Guard in 1939 to ride horses. And I'm gonna jump, well, I went with the 101st Cavalry, and I was assigned to the 10th Cavalry after I came back from uh, Officer's Candidate School. I was told that this is war stories. I've been on three panels. My voice is kind of kaput, but I know two war stories you might enjoy. Are any of you out there Catholics? Raise your hand. A few. Well, in the 10th Cavalry, we had a Captain Bulky with a walrus mustache, and I think he used to practice frowning, so he'd scare us. But having been in the National Guard for so long, I felt like we, it was an equal, an equalization. One day we fell out, and it was a holy day of obligation. And I said to the captain, sir, it's a holy day of obligation, and any Catholics should be, let to go, let, uh, be allowed to go. Now remember, this is a horse cavalry outfit. He, he, he started to say, what you, when did, oh, I asked him how many men were, about eight men raised their hands. He started to say, when did you go to mass last? I said, no, they're entitled to go. He grumbled, grumbled and said, Go ahead and take them. And I topped it off and said, now we need four Protestant horse holders. You don't get it. Thank okay. you. Okay, Mr. Bloxham. We don't know as much as we should about the Merchant Marines, but you must have known something about it to lead you there. Well, I guess the sea was in my blood. Uh, I, a little tight, I had a fleet of little, little wooden boats that I'd take in the bathtub instead of a rubber ducky. And uh, as I grew older, my father and I built a little sailboat. I went in the Boy Scouts and then into the Sea Scouts. It was a while in the Sea Scouts I heard of the Pennsylvania school ship. So I applied and uh, spent two years on the Pennsylvania school ship. Uh, I had broken my leg, so I was in the hospital for six weeks with a broken leg. So my class graduated in October of 41, and uh, I was told I wouldn't graduate till next May. Well, when Pearl Harbor occurred, I went up to the executive officer and said, I'm just repeating what I, I had before, and they need 
officers in the merchant marine, so he says, go up and take your examination for third mate. And I did that, and the day after Christmas, why, I headed up to New York and was uh, posted to the SS Keystone, which was a World War I cargo ship. That started my career in the merchant service. Uh, Mr. Bloxham, can you describe your feelings when you learned that you would be sailing your ship into a combat area? Well, when I was that age, I guess it didn't bother me. It was the older people that uh, it really bothered. Uh, I was just happy to be on a ship. On the school ship, I had slept in a hammock. A third mate on the Keystone. I had my own room. I had a, a man to make up my room and keep it clean. I ate at a table with tablecloths. And uh, yeah, I don't think it bothered me that much uh, on my first trip. Uh, it was the older people that I really admired that went to sea because they were too old to get in the, the military and they would volunteer. Uh, they had a license so they would come and go to sea. Uh, the uh, second trip I made, we had an older chief mate on there. And the first night out of New York, uh, I came off watch at midnight and uh, I lay down to go to sleep, and I heard the alarm bells ringing in the engineer's quarters. So I strapped on my 45, put on my life jacket, and went to the bridge, and they said that uh, two ships in the convoy had been torpedoed, and uh, they were all hands supposed to go to their abandoned ship station. So I went up to my lifeboat, checked off the crew, and then, uh, I saw the mate wasn't up there checking off his boat. So I went down to his room, and we were supposed to sleep with our clothes on. So I knocked, and I said, hey, mate, the alarm bells went off. And he grunted. I said, hey, mate, the alarm bells went off. And he grunted again. I said, hey, mate, there's two ships sunk in the convoy. He came out of his bunk just as fast as he could forgot he had his clothes on, his pants dropped down, and he went face first on the deck. And I felt sorry for those older men that, you know, had some sense and awareness, and us young kids, we, nothing bothered us. So that, that was my uh, thoughts on uh, some of the, co the merchant marine. In other words, you finally got the message of what combat was like. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Luca, I'm going to ask you the same question. Can you describe your feelings when you first learned that you were going to be assigned to a combat area? Fear, fear. <laughs> well, combat is, an infantryman is, uh, it's just brutal business. And it's, it's pretty hard to talk about it. Because it's so unreal to myself, and you wonder how anybody can believe what you try to tell them. But I usually put a, like to tell some funny things. In one incident where we got pinned down, and we, we had to wait for some tanks to come up and knock the machine gun down. And I, they told us to dig in, and I was in a small gully, and I wanted to go deeper. So I started digging with my hands, and I pushed the dirt out, and my elbow went up above the gully, and a shot rang out, and a bullet hit in front of my face and threw dirt. And I, I wanted to go, I wanted to go deeper. So I started again, and my elbow went up again, and the shot rang out. And I figured the snipers got me zeroed in. He had to be pretty bad to miss me twice. So uh, here I am uh, pinned down by a machine, or by a sniper, 
and I had a small box of crackers in my jacket, so I'm laying there waiting for the tank, and I'm eating crackers. Marty, did you hear the question that I asked the other two? Did you hear the question that I asked the other two? Can you describe your feelings when you learn that you were being assigned to a combat area? Pardon my voice. As a matter of fact, I was with the 10th Cavalry, which I mentioned earlier. It's a tremendous, there are colored enlisted men and white officers. I thought we were going into combat together. When we arrived in Oran, Africa, they told us that the colored men would become support troops. We had an opportunity to miss the war or get into combat. I'd say 99% of the junior officers opted. We wanted to get into combat. We were assigned to, uh, we went to an infantry school, a training for about a period, a month and a half. And then I was assigned to the 36th Division. There was no apprehension on our part. We wanted to get into combat. But I joined this panel primarily because I heard it was to tell war stories. The other panels were pretty serious. So I'm gonna be relatively light. Oh, oh, first I'll say this. I always thought when I hit the beach, I'd get rid of my helmet, it was so cumbersome. I also thought if I lost an arm and a leg, I wouldn't wanna come back. When I actually hit the beach and they started shelling us, I could get my whole body into that helmet. <laughs> After two weeks of fighting, I thought if I only lose an arm and a leg, I have it made. But at one point, we were chased. Yes? Let me stop you for a minute. Uh, excuse me a minute, Marty, excuse me. But I understand that uh, we have Congressman Stenny Hoyer who is with us, and he would like to say a few words to you. Uh, Congressman Hoyer is from the state of Maryland, and he is a member of the Five Star Council. Congressman Hoyer. First of all, let me apologize. I got caught in some traffic back there, a lot of people, wonderful oh, event, sorry. and I don't want to interrupt these folks. So I'm going to take two seconds to say to all of you that uh, if you haven't read, but there's a beautiful magazine, uh, Life Magazine's put it out. And I was at the prayer breakfast the American Legion had this morning. And uh, I read it, and the first two or three pages are written by Bob Green, the son of a veteran of World War II. And gentlemen and lady, he says in it, uh, he virtually never spoke about the painting. This was a painting of his father that hung in the wall, uh, hung on the wall in their house. It was of his father as a captain in uniform. He said he virtually never spoke about the painting. It was on the wall of our house all during my childhood. And in fact, when my mother moved to another house, they took it with them. Most remarkable of all, they seldom spoke about it, meaning his experience in World War II. Those who did make it home, those who survived the fighting, went about their lives and started families and reported to work in a different America, an America of the post-victory years in which the former soldiers were expected to wear different uniforms, obey different rules. They became the men in the gray final suits of the factory coveralls of the service station caps and slacks. And it was almost as if they thought they were supposed to forget about the war, except for inside their own hearts. It was almost as if no one told them this. They must have decided it on their own. They felt they were obliged to keep it to themselves. My stepfather uh, fought in the Pacific. He flew a B-25 and he was shot down in the Battle of the Coral Sea and lost two of his crew. He rarely talked about it. This history project is about making sure that those who remain help us remember so that we do not repeat. Also to give us courage and encouragement from their lives, from their heroism. And so, lady and gentlemen, I apologize for interrupting, but I wanted to be brief because the whole point is to hear from you. God bless you.
Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Congressman. Would you like to continue? Uh, I apologize to Marty, uh, but now we will give him a chance to continue. I was interrupted at a good time. At one point, we lost track of the Germans. We didn't know where they were. And they gave me five jeeps and told me to go out to certain towns. We couldn't rely on our radios. In each town, I was supposed to send a jeep back and say, everything's okay. Remember, five towns. The first town we hit, they put out the American flags, they brought out champagne, and so people joined us with rifles. I sent the jeep back, everything's okay. Second town, the same thing. Third time, the same thing. And my orders were, if you find any Germans, get an estimate of their number and get the hell out. Well, each town I hit, I had, well, by the time I hit the fifth town, I had an army. And all these flares were flying, all the Germans could possibly come through there. And I thank God they did it because if all of a sudden I said goodbye, boys, I can speak a little French then. I can't speak any now. But I felt I was very, very lucky that the Germans didn't uh, occupy any areas. That's my story. Thank you, Roger. Okay, my next question. All of you have been through some really tough, dangerous, scary situations, whether from the weather or the enemy or both. What helped you get through that? Well, when you go to sea, you're, you're liable to run into a little weather now and then. Uh, I was chief mate on the Augustus S. Merriman that was built in Wilmington, North Carolina. We went to Charleston and loaded 9,000 tons of aerial bombs. Uh, they were very careful. We had the Coast Guard, the Fire Department, the Army, the Navy, and I don't know who else there to make sure they were loaded correctly. Uh, we uh, then proceeded to Norfolk where we loaded 1,000 tons of a PX cargo, beer and, and all the goodies that the military needed to operate. And uh, we went to the Med. We went into Iran and the, uh, they offloaded the thousand tons of PX cargo. And they said, okay, you can take a thousand tons of bombs aboard. So the uh, I'm on deck and I'm looking up up uh, where the bombs are coming from and this big army truck comes down and he's got a load of bombs aboard. He does a 180, backs up full speed, hits the brakes and all the bombs come off <laughs> the back of the truck. I tell you, my hair grayed a, a little bit that day. But, uh, then uh, we went up to Brindisi, Italy and uh, offloaded our cargo, came back to La Galette, which is the uh, seaport for Tunis, and loaded 1,500 tons of aluminum scrap and started out uh, in a large convoy for, the, uh, uh, for New York. We got south of the Azores, and we got in the middle of a real hurricane. And uh, those convoys were about six knots, and they slowed us down to about five knots, and the wind was blowing, and the seas were 20, 30 feet high, and uh, finally, uh, I was on watch, and the, we couldn't hold her. She fell off the port, did a 180, and uh, then I goofed her up to, to full speed, and got her back, headed into the, the uh, waves again, 
but we were out of the convoy at that time. They dropped the DE back with us. And I swear, that DE stayed with us for the two days of the hurricane. We were eating soup and sandwiches, but those poor guys on that DE, she'd come out of the water and you could see all the way from the bow to under the pilot house, and then she'd go down the wave and you could see all the way from the aft to the pilot house. And I just felt so sorry for those seamen on that DE that stayed with us the whole way until the storm was over and we were able to rejoin the convoy. And why are you still with us? <laughs> why are you still with us? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> okay, we'll wonder too. Uh, Mr. DeLuca, you were in some scary situations. What helped you survive? What helped you get through it? I could run fast. <laughs> you have to remember this was uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You eat when you can and you clean up when you can. I went 28 days, I never had a change of clothes or bath. And that's for 50 bucks a month. And there's one real close one that was always in my mind. <clears throat> it was in the Voges Mountains. And the terrain is so bad there that the tanks and artillery couldn't accompany the infantry. And we called it, when the odds were even, infantrymen against infantrymen. And our squad was leading the, the column. And you couldn't spread out very much. So we come to a sharp bend on the road, and the sergeant held up. Wasn't quite sure, it looked like a good ambush place. But we had orders to keep moving. So the two scouts went around the curve, and uh, then our BAR man, and then the sergeant, and I took one step, and the machine gun opened up and got them all. And uh, I fell back against the wall, and bank and I just shaking and crying really because you're a soldier don't mean you're not scared and can't cry then they put us back in the column and another squad took over then as I passed them I, I just broke down these are guys you went out you trained with and went out and got drunk I wasn't of age and uh and then all at once they're gone, and about another two steps it would have been me. It's just a, a brutal, brutal business. In one way, I, I kind of got in my mind that that German soldier was a thing. It wasn't human. And that thing is trying to kill me, so I got to do it first. I try to hold my sanity but I was scared. I don't think I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I was assigned, when I made that landing, I had been assigned to the 36th Division. We made the Southern France landing with about 600 men in the battalion. I'll tell you later, we were cut off for seven days in the Vosges Mountains that Joe referred to. But our company commander, Captain McNeil, was killed about two weeks after we landed. Lieutenant Daughtry took over. He was, he was killed about another two weeks. And then as Lieutenant Lavallee took over. He had been our weapons platoon leader. And I was a second lieutenant at the time. We were running with Araya, and this Colonel Steele was giving Lavallee orders to attack, and he stalled all day. And finally, Colonel Steele came up and asked me if I would take the company, and I said, yes. I'm not going to go through the rest of the bit about the company and the fighting, except I'll jump stick it to, we were cut off in the, in the Vosges Mountains 
from October 24th to October 30th, the village of the mountains that Joe is referring to. The Japanese Americans rescued us with a tremendous loss of life. There were about, well, I, don't, I can't, at least 400 casualties, 54 killed to save 211 men. But to answer your question, when we met, hit the beach, there were 18 line officers in the battalion. When we were cut off, I was the only one left. And I attributed that to my wife saying the stations of the cross and the rosary every day. And she continued it the rest of her life. Your religious faith. Thank you. Uh, I want to lighten this up a little bit. Uh, I know that uh, when you were in combat under fire, that things were really rough, and the only thing you could think about was survival. But there were times, I'm sure, that you were not in combat, that you were not under fire. So can you tell me uh, what life was like at those times when you were not actually on the fire, how did you relax? What kind of entertainment? How did you entertain yourself? Uh, let's begin with you, Mr. Bloxham. Well, we didn't have TV aboard ship at that time, so there was a lot of card playing. Uh, uh, we had a lot of time to ourselves at sea. Uh, I think I read many books some on the sea even. And uh, the, we used to fish for sharks now and again. If we were in a convoy that uh, was only making uh, six knots, you could put a piece of meat on a, a meat hook and haul it over the stern and every once in a while you'd catch a shark. Uh, ashore, of course, why I'm afraid to say we headed for the nearest bar and, and uh, celebrated that we had made it that far. Uh, Joe? Well, we very seldom got to the rear when they were short of infantry money. We just had to keep going. But the few times you would, the first thing you wanted to do was bathe and eat a hot meal. And any spare time I did, I, I slept. I was totally exhausted, dirty, wet, just tough. Marty? We were in, in the lines 119 days before I got captured. So I'm gonna jump back and say, in, when I graduated from OCS, I was sent to the 10th Cavalry, riding horses every day and getting paid for it. Weekends, we play polo with jump. I couldn't get enough of it. I was stationed on the California border. We were 60 miles south of San Diego, 60 miles west of El Centro. It was such a fabulous post, I wanted to marry Marge. And an officer's wife can make or break them. And she, when she, when we got back to camp, I could make this longer, but I'll, make this, I'll be relatively brief. She went to the library to get a book. A woman approached and said, can you play bridge? Maud said, yes. And the woman said, will you join us? So she sat down at the bridge table. The first woman said, my name is Helen Brown. My husband is a division commander. The second one said, my name is Claire Fork. My husband is a regimental commander. The third one said, my name is Bettina Ward. My husband is, a, is the general's aide. Marge said, my name is Marge Higgins. My, my husband is a platoon leader. I don't know where you get the significance of that. It's the lowest place you could be. Thank you. You've always he all heard the story that a seaman has a girl in every port. Well, if you look down front here, this beautiful lady in the wheelchair 
Whatever port I came in in the United States, she traveled to, whether it was Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston. So actually, I had a girl in every port. But it was the same girl. <laughs> Okay, um, it's hard for some veterans to share their story um, for lots of good reasons that we understand, but you have chosen to share yours, and we think that's wonderful. Why did you choose to share your story? Well, I wrote a book for the family of all my seagoing experiences, and it was in the Parade magazine about a year ago. They asked for veteran stories. So I sent an email into the Library of Congress, and they said, sure. So uh, I sent them my book, and I sent it uh, on a CD. And then about three months ago, I, I had a call from the Library of Congress said, we have lots of stories from the Army, Navy, and Marines, but we haven't got any from the, the Merchant Marine. Would you act as a representative of the Merchant Marine? And I said, sure. So that's why I'm here. Very good. <laughs> Mr. DeLuca, why did you share your story? Well, I still belong to the 103rd Division uh, Association, and they encourage us to go out and talk. In the last six years, I've been talking to history classes, and I'm still nervous. But I think a lot of us veterans would say they aren't teaching the kids about World War II. And uh, the classes I go to, they really go to a lot of trouble and then if none of the veterans would show up, uh, what would the kids think? What I, did it, what I didn't go into, and I did at these other panels, was that Japanese Americans who rescued us had tremendous ca uh, casualties. Now, we didn't know this. I was a keynote speaker at the Punch Bowl in the year of March of 2000, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1997, Kleinsteidel wrote a book called The Lost Battalions. Turned out there was one of us and one of the Germans. My son had asked me to send him his memoirs, and I, my memoirs, and I did. I sent them out to Franz. Well, most of it was about horse cavalry, which he couldn't use. But he picked up the part about the infantry, and he put a, a chapter in the book about Marty Higgins and Jimmy Canawad. That was the first time we realized the losses they suffered. I have attended everything the Japanese Americans, but that's the reason I'm here now. We had a panel the other day, two panels, and we had a, a dinner at the Harvest Moon last night, and I was the keynote speaker and it was heartwarming, and they gave me a beautiful watch. That's how I got started. Well, we've had some wonderful comments here this afternoon, and I have uh, one last question I'd like to ask to either one of you. Is there anything else that you would like to add to, add to this? I'd like to do a little advertising for the John Brown, which is one of the two remaining operable liberty ships. If you care to see what life at sea was like during the war on a liberty ship, go to Baltimore, go aboard the John Brown and see the conditions that we lived under. Joseph, um, Marty, is there anything you would like to add? Anything more you would like to add? You must meet my son, Michael. He's here. He has written books about the Merchant Marine. And about six months ago, Ali North has war stories on the History Channel. And Mike was featured. I made a videotape of it. He loved to talk to him. 
As far as I am concerned, I might disagree with other veterans. I think each generation does what it has to do. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. And now we will uh, open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, anyone with a question? Yes, sir, you over there? Can, can you pass the question on? What was the question? Okay. I think we've got the question. What was your reaction when you learned that the war was over? Well, I was in the English Channel westbound in a convoy uh, when they announced the end of the war in Europe. Uh, we were told we would meet an eastbound convoy, and uh, at that procedure was we would just go down each other's columns. This worked good. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and they LST convoy from France came in at 90 degrees angle, and we had 17 different collisions between ships. And so that, that wasn't a very good greeting for VE Day. In uh, VJ Day, I was en route from uh, Pensacola to uh, Philipville, North Africa, and we were told that uh, we would discharge our cargo in North Africa, and then load up cargo for uh, the Pacific War area. And when we were announced, I tell you, we were real happy that the whole thing was over. Well, we were in Innsbruck, Austria, and, and they told us it was all over. And <clears throat> he was pretty happy. You were. I went seven straight months on the front line. I never was wounded. And uh, I had all my limbs. And we got, we got really drunk. <laughs> and I thought I was going to die from that. The best way I could react to the question is I was on the first boatload of POWs that entered New York Harbor. The tug boats came out tooting, the fire boats came out with their hoses going, and they had martial music playing on the yachts. Now, I had lived in Jersey City, and I passed the Statue of Liberty every time I went to New York. Then it was only a statue. When I came back and saw it, I knew it was liberty. We have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I wondered if Marty could share some of his experiences as a POW. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have, but the interesting thing to me, and I'll tell you this much, I got my commission in Jersey City in November of 42, and Frank Maxwell got his commission. I was in the cavalry. He got his in the infantry. We were both back, he went back to Fort Benning for orders. I went back to the, to the uh, Fort Riley Cavalry School to get mine. I was assigned to the 10th Cavalry and was riding horses till March of 44. When I got to the POW camp, uh, we were captured December 10th. There's an incident, I met Heinrich Himmler, but we don't have time to go through that. But when I got the, uh, into the Aflac 64, there was Frank Maxwell. He had been a POW for two years, and he was sent home in two weeks. He was repatriated with ulcers. He gave me his extra long johns, and that's another story that will come in, and his extra wool socks. But the most significant thing, he was able to go home and tell my wife I was alive. If, 
if you want to meet, I could go on and on. The PO thing uh, was not the happiest, but in fact, it was the lowest point of my life. And I don't have the time to go into that, but, but uh, just think about it. Well, once again, I want to say thank you to the gentleman here and uh, to my co-moderator and to you, ladies and gentlemen, for sitting, listening to these wonderful stories. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.